So it really is an honor to be with you this morning. Um, so I'm going to be sharing on Psalm 23. So if you have your Bibles, I will read the text and then talk about praying our, our faith and our fear. But before I get into it, again, I just want to acknowledge you, Jesus, head of your church, bought with your precious blood. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. We just honor you. We honor your presence here by your Holy Spirit. And we receive you, Holy Spirit, sent from the Father and the Son to instruct us in the truth of the kingdom. So, Lord, open our minds. Give us eyes to, to see, ears to hear, hearts to truly grasp and understand. You are the spirit of truth who reveals Jesus and the Father to us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, instruct us. Enable me to speak only the words that you are speaking. And what doesn't come from you, Lord, let it fall to the ground and die. But what comes from you, may it produce much fruit. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So... This Sunday in the Christian calendar is what is called Palm Sunday. Uh, next week Sunday is Resurrection Day, Easter, um, Easter Sunday. Friday, of course, is Good Friday, whereby we remember the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, but the week before, uh, preparation for the Passover began on the Sunday when Jesus went into Jerusalem, not on a horse, as Pilate Pontius Pilatus, who came down from Caesarea, the beautiful Roman city built on the coast of Palestine, and came from there to Jerusalem to be in charge of that final week of preparation for the whole week of Passover because of the threat of Jewish insurrection, Jewish rebellion. He would have come in, he would have come into Jerusalem probably at the more or less the same time as Jesus from the other side of the city on a horse, indicating the conqueror, the ruler. Jesus came on a donkey, <laughs> indicating a different king who brings peace and reconciliation, not to rule over the people through might and power, but to humbly offer Israel shalom and reconciliation. That is the king that we worship, the humble king the gentle king. So we are honored to be in the king's presence together and not just online. And for those of you who are online, I bless you, I salute you, I greet you in the name of Jesus. And may you know the presence of the king. He's not limited to a building, although face to face is way better <laughs> than, how's it, guys out there? <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to read with me Psalm 23. I do have a book out there on the table called Praying the Psalms, and it's 12 psalms for 12 weeks, a program of a 12-week meditation program to teach us Hebraic prayer, which is praying the Word of God, God's inspired prayers that He gave to Israel through David, um, which Jesus was steeped in and knew by heart, and all Orthodox Jews today have learned all 150 psalms by heart. So I'm working on volume two of Praying the Psalms, Praying Life's um, Challenges and Choices, and Psalm 23 will be in volume two. And uh, last time I was here, I think, Richard, I spoke on Psalm 16 in January, I think, at the end of January, um, praying our safety and security. This psalm is praying our faith and our fear because the opposite of faith is not unbelief as in doubt. The opposite of faith is fear. When you are fearful, you no longer trust, but you are tempted to take things into your own hands to secure yourself so that you don't fear whatever you may be fearing. So faith and fear biblically are opposites. And we need to pray our faith in God in order that we don't fear. One of the most common phrases in the Gospels is, don't be scared, don't be afraid. Jesus said that repeatedly to people, and equally, he repeatedly said, 
your faith has made you well. And faith and fear all the time. So this psalm is probably some of the best words ever written in human literature. And in the Hebrew, it is a remarkable poem that is so well structured. And David, who was a shepherd of his father's sheep as he was a young teenager growing up for years, sat out in the countryside in the wilderness with his father's sheep, and he contemplated the Lord and wrote many songs that became psalms, that became prayers of Israel through all the centuries. And the Judaism today still attributes the Psalter, 150 psalms to David, although here and there other people have authored some of the psalms. So this psalm was obviously written as a prayer to God and a praise to God out of David's experience of being a shepherd of his father's sheep. And as he looked after his father's sheep, he became incredibly aware as he grew up as a teenager that Yahweh was his shepherd. And what I'm doing to my father's sheep <laughs> and all that that involves is what God is doing to me, the God of Israel, Yahweh. And so we can learn from David and pray his prayers, um, especially at this time in Corona, with all that's going on and the economic challenges, um, etc. So, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm reading from the NIV. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, this psalm, like most of the psalms, have a clear inclusio, an opening and a closing, like book ends on a bookshelf. And then in between, you get the contents. It starts off with, the Lord is my shepherd. And then the last phrase is, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's personal name, Yahweh, is mentioned. And David had no problem speaking to God on personal name terms. Later, it became uh, a problem of presumption in Israel where they no longer used the holy name but instead replaced it with Adonai so that people don't blaspheme and misuse God's personal name. And then from then on, only the high priest in entering the Holy of Holies pronounced the holy name once a year on Yom Kippur. But David starts with God's personal name and ends with God's personal name. And he also starts with I and ends with I. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not be in need. I will have no needs. And he ends up saying, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So it's I and God on personal name terms. And right in the middle of the psalm, and this is typical in the way they used to write Hebrew poetry, is you have an opening and a closing that rounds it off, and then a center. The center of the, of the psalm is verse 4, and the statement is, I will fear no evil. There's another I. Although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That sets the theme of the psalm. God is my shepherd, and I trust him absolutely and completely. Therefore, I will fear no evil. And the result is, I will live in his house forever. <laughs> it's beautiful. And we will get to the end point, but it already makes me feel emotional. Because <laughs> I know what I'm going to say, and it's beautiful. We have a different concept, I think, of the house of the Lord than to what the Hebrews used to have in those days and what Jesus had in his mind. In any case, let me then start. What is just a further comment on the structure of the psalm. So it starts off with Yahweh, Yahweh, I, I, in the middle, I, I will not fear. But then the first three verses is the third person pronoun. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. 
He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then in the second half, after I will fear no evil, it's the second person pronoun. You put a banquet before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with, with oil. And it goes to personal you. And it ends up with, again, the personal name Yahweh and the I. So let's go through it. The, the, the opening image is that of the shepherd. And it says, I, because God, I take Yahweh as my shepherd, I will not want. And in Israel those days, all leaders, all uh, rulers, kings, um, even in the ancient Near East world, not only in Israel, the kings would equivalent to our president would be called a shepherd, the shepherd of the nation that would guide and lead. So the dominant image, um, imagery for leadership in the Old Testament is shepherd and servant. How far it is from the dominant image today <laughs> of what presidents and business leaders are. <laughs> but still, Yahweh is my shepherd. They learned from God and God's nature that defined who they were in terms of leadership and people rather than imposing on God their imagery of what they think God ought to be. So who God is defines who they ought to be. Yahweh is my shepherd. And David as king, who later became king, we don't know when he wrote the psalm, whether he wrote it as when he was king. The presumption it was, it was before he was, became king, and then it was structured, tidied up, and put into the Psalter. But he learned from Yahweh how to be king, to be the shepherd of his people. Yahweh is my shepherd, therefore he takes care of my needs. I will not want. And it's exactly what Jesus, the good shepherd, taught about the nature of God. God is good. The Hebrew word good is tov. God is tov. He is absolutely good. And if we seek first the kingdom of God and God's justice and righteousness, he will add all these other things that we need. And in the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's food. It's my need for food. My need for all your basic human needs, food, clothing, house, um, water, all that we need in terms of life. God is a good father, and he will look after us as a shepherd looks after the sheep. And then he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, what is interesting is that when, when the shepherd in those days, yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, whatever, David was 1,000 BC, 1,000 years before Christ. So it's 3,000 years ago. And you put yourself, how many of you have been to Israel on a visit to the Holy Land, and you know Palestine, it's, it, you know, from Ju the city of David, Bethlehem, which is right next to Jerusalem, it's on the edge of the Judean desert wilderness that goes down to the Dead Sea, and it's very dry. But when the shepherd would lead the sheep out and go to look for pastures, it would be into the wilderness, literally into the, the wilderness desert, where he would go look for green pastures for the sheep to feed. And there would be no cell phone towers, there would be no cell phones. There would be no landlines. There would be no means of communication with the world back home. When you led the sheep out to go look for pasture and for drink, you would be entirely dependent on that shepherd for your protection and security. Because it was known that David, when he was young, he killed the lion, he killed the bear, he killed the wolf, the wild animals, the bandits, the thieves that would come and steal the sheep out there hiding in the, in the wilderness area, which was a lot of places to hide. In other words, the imagery here, if you take it in its context, and by the way, I just want to acknowledge a, a Dr. Kenneth Bailey on his background understanding of the psalm and some of the other commentaries that I've used. But just to say, when they say, Yahweh is my shepherd, and he, makes, he leads me out, and he makes me lie down in green pastures, they knew exactly what they were saying. My life in this rough and challenging world is entirely dependent on God. 
And therefore, I choose to believe God. I trust Him. I'm praying my faith in Him. And the opening imagery is of Yahweh feeds me. And in those days, you would go most of the land up in the Israel's on the, at least Jerusalem, Bethlehem's on the highland. Then you go down into the the Judean desert, down towards the Dead Sea. It would be dry and arid with patches of green grass. And the, the grass that was green, pastures that were green, was basically the best food. Yahweh is my shepherd. He will feed me with the best food. He will take me there and feed me so that even I can rest and feed. And just notice, sheep don't eat the shepherd. <laughs> the shepherd doesn't lie down and say, eat me. <laughs> the, the shepherd leads the sheep to the pastures and you go to eat. And in, 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 in Jewish terms, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. Through spiritual practices, we feed on what God has given us, the best of the food. And then he leads me beside quiet waters. And of course, good shepherds in those days used to lead their sheep by, work, by walking out ahead of them and singing a little song. K Kenneth Bailey, who is uh, actually an American, but was born of missionary parents in Egypt spent over 45 years working in the Middle East, in Egypt, Lebanon, then in Israel. And he knows the historical context uh, in a profound way. And he actually sings the little song, a 10-second a ten little song in Aramaic, the language that Jesus would have spoken, that the shepherds sang for their sheep to follow them. And so when Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd, I lead my sheep out. I know them by name, I call them by name. They recognize my voice, a hireling, uh, the enemy, whatever other bandits or thieves come to try and take the sheep. They won't recognize their voice and they won't follow them. You remember all of that. And so in South Africa, a shepherd you know, goes behind the sheep and blucks them, uh, you know, and drives them. You know, they, 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 they drive the sheep where they want to go. Uh, God does not drive you. God does not compel you. God does not coerce you. God does not force you. God does not push you. God leads you by calling you by your name. And by, and by singing songs, as Zephaniah says, he, he sings songs over us. We recognize his voice. We know his voice. He goes ahead of us to take upon himself whatever enemy comes against us before the enemy can reach us. He absorbs in his own body whatever evil is going to attack us has got to get past him first. That is who God is in your life today through Jesus, the good shepherd of the sheep. And so he leads me beside quiet waters. What is interesting, still waters, my time's going and I'm enjoying it too much. I, I better move on. But still waters as opposed to choppy waters because still waters meant that the, that the water was shallow and there weren't holes where the water was deep and could whip the water up or the wind could whip the water up in case the sheep in drinking would lose their footing and fall into the water, and if they fell into a hole, their wool would become waterlogged and they would drown quickly. And so this is the particular care of the shepherd that leads the sheep to still waters, to safe footing that they can drink safely without the danger of losing their footing and falling into the water and drowning. This is, if you understand the background, there is such exquisite, tender care of detail by the shepherd looking after the sheep. That is who God is to you. And you must pray that. The way they would use the text is, Yahweh, you are my shepherd. I've got no needs because all I need is you, Yahweh. They would actually pray the song. Yahweh, you make me rest with the best feast all around me in your word and your presence. Yahweh, you lead me to the best crystal clear waters where I'm safe to drink. 
That's how they would personalize it and pray. He restores my soul. Restore here in the Hebrew is not just refreshing and renewing, but actually retrieving and rescuing. Because sometimes the sheep would get lost. And if he, you, you, you wandered off and you left the flock and you got lost on your own, the sheep would become terrified and they would look for a, a crevice or under a bush to hide and they would bleat for the shepherd, call for help. And they would actually become uh, paralyzed. And Jesus refers to this image in Luke chapter 15 of the shepherd, the good shepherd. If one of the flock, of, if one of the hundred flock gets lost, he leaves the 99 to go and restore that sheep. And what's interesting is the image in the early church was of the shepherd, Jesus, with the sheep over his shoulders. The shepherd would go and use the staff to, to pull the sheep out of the little donga if it fell down or, or wherever it was, the crevice, and pull it out. Put it on its shoulders. And you know, the biggest sheep would be the weight of, of an adult male, 80, 90 kilograms. And there's the, there, are, there, there are frescoes from the early catech, uh, the catacombs. You know that 150 years ago, under the Vatican City in Rome, they found the earliest burial grounds for, for Christians in caves, in catacombs. And on the walls, the dominant image of Christianity in those days was of Jesus the shepherd carrying a sheep. And the sheep was almost as big as he was, carrying it. The second dominant image was the fish, and the third one was the vine. The cross only became the symbol and image of Christianity after Constantine abolished the persecution of the Christian faith, and basically made it the official religion of the empire, then the cross changed from being this absolutely cruel symbol of, uh, of killing Christians through Emperor Nero, then Emperor Diocletians, and then um, um, uh, Caligula in the 1800s, at least 135 AD. So the cross, as the dominant image of Christianity, was was only after 300 years, the dominant image in the early days was of the shepherd carrying the sheep on its shoulders of the early church. They related because the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish. And so just to say to you, he restores my soul. <laughs> Jesus tells the story. He says, the good shepherd goes and finds the one that got lost, puts it, and he actually says, Jesus says, in Luke 15, puts the sheep on his shoulders and carries it home and leaves the other 99 in the wilderness because he's so overjoyed. And at home, he has a party with his friends that he's found the one sheep. And basically, Jesus is saying to Israel, you think you're all saved and you belong to Yahweh, but you're all in the wilderness and you all actually need to be saved, not just the lost one. And the context there is important, which I don't have time to go into because I'm normally given to all of these rabbit holes and my time's going away and I need to get back to the text. So, and then he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Righteousness, tzedak in the Hebrew, is the right way of living, the right way of behaving, the right way of walking, the right way of talking. Yahweh, as my shepherd, leads me how to treat people, how to live my life step by step. He guides me. He leads me. He coaches me. He trains me how to, for his name's sake, because the integrity and reputation of the shepherd is at stake. And it's for his name's sake. He teaches us how to live our lives as he would if he were us. He guides us in the paths of righteousness. And then this phrase, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I choose to fear no evil because you are with me. And so there was a known from Jerusalem through the Judean desert down to Jericho at the Dead Sea, there are steep wadis and valleys with paths to go to get through. And so there is a place actually called the valley of the shadow of death. And when the shepherd had to lead the sheep through valleys and wadis, cliffs area, to get to green pastures and still waters, 
um, the, the, the sheep would be scared because the path would become narrow. And so the point is this, dear friends, even though you get COVID, even though you lose your job, even though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, even though you go through deep, dark testing, you know, in Ezekiel chapter 34, the whole chapter is on the shepherds of Israel, the false shepherds. And then God says he will become the shepherd of Israel through his Messiah, King. And there's a phrase in there, Ezekiel 34, it says, every sheep has its dark and dreadful day. How many of you know there's a Gethsemane for every one of us in our lives? And sometimes, a few times in your life, you go through the valley of the shadow of death, but you have no need to fear because God is with you. And in Jesus, even death is now defeated. And for David, who looked forward to his son of David to be the Mashiach that would defeat death, he's already anticipating the defeat of death and the fear of death because Hebrews says that Jesus, if God became human in Jesus, that he tasted death that he might free all those who were held under bondage by the fear of death. Because David ends up saying, you know, even if I do die, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I win this side of death and I win that side of death. Either way, I win. Because Yahweh is my shepherd. And, you, and I, I will not fear. It's a choice. It's a decision to assert your faith in God's care, love, and protection, even in the face of the worst crisis that hits you. He's walking with you in and through that crisis and will lead you around the craggy path through the valley out the other side. He doesn't save us from our problems. He walks with us through our problems so that we come out the other side better people for it because we've learned faith and rejected fear. We've learned to trust God in the face of the worst evil can throw at us because ultimately he has defeated it all. And so then he says, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And it also says nine o'clock. And it says, I'm halfway. Oh, help me, Jesus. So just rod, they had two, the shepherds carried two staffs. The, the rod was the nobkiri to fight off the animals and the enemies. So a South African, if you're from overseas, God bless you, you're not sure what a nobkiri is. We know what nobkiris are. And then the staff is the one with a crook on to help guide the sheep and hook the sheep around the, the neck and pull them out of the crag or guide them if they're going the wrong way. And there is both, the rod and the staff that guide me and comfort me. Then the image changes from the shepherd out taking us out into the wilderness of life and leading us through life into the host in the home. Because the shepherd king gives us a banquet. <clears throat> and let me just, I'll, I'll just bring it together. Now the shepherd king lays the banquet for us and invites us in. And the imagery of feeding us with the best green pastures and the best clear waters, still waters, is repeated because he lays a banquet to feed us. And my cup overflows with the best of wine. Rubicon 1982, Mielas Rubicon. For those of you who, who, who know red wines, God bless you. And if you don't know red wines, don't, you know, don't drink any wine, remain as you are. But now and again, I enjoy the blood of Jesus a bit. <laughs> my cup overflows. He anoints my head with oil. You know that when you went into the presence, not the host of a home, and even the king, the servants washed feet as the common uh, courtesy to welcome everyone. But if your head was anointed with oil, you were an honored guest. You were an honored guest. You were a noble prince, princess, one of the honored guests. Oh man, he brings me into his banqueting house. His banner over me is love. He prepares this feast. He anoints my head with oil. 
My cup overflows. And it's all in the presence of demons, spiritual powers, evil that wants to have a go at us all the time. Because the devil does not let up. And, and it really is a warfare that we are in. But God is king. And in the presence of whatever threatens us in life. So if you are struggling, and I appreciate the, the worship team this morning, <clears throat> both the words of fatherhood and father's broken promise and healing. Jesus is here healing, walking from person to person. Your enemy, if it's your broken body, if it's your tormented mind, if it's your lack of finances, if it's your fear of terminal illness, whatever it is, your fear of failure, if it's your poor self-image, if it's depression, whatever, you know, the early church fathers took the Psalms and they interpreted all the enemy talk, praying against enemies as the spiritual powers that torment us and try to attack us and demonize us. That's why Jesus taught his followers to pray. Pray this prayer, Lord, let your kingdom come. Give me my green pastures every day. Give me my food, the food I need today for today. And lead me not down the wrong path. Don't lead me into the testing and the trial. But Lord, deliver me from evil. Because yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. You rule and reign. Satan doesn't. That's what Jesus taught. Jesus was steeped in the theology of God as shepherd. And he called himself the good shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. And so it ends up saying, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days. And then the Hebrew, it's lovely. Tov is good, which is used in Genesis after the first day he made this. And it was good. Tov. And then the second day he looked, it was good. On the, on the sixth day of creation, the climax of creation, he made, then let us make human beings in our image. And then it was? It was very, it was, it was, it was oy vey tov. It was like really, very good. God is a good God. That's where the devil would like to question God's character by make you believe God's not good because he allows bad things to happen in your life. And this is Hebraic understanding. Tov and chesed. Chesed is covenant faithfulness, God's covenant love, whereby his promises, all that he's promised, he will be faithful to. They will not only follow me because enemies used to follow people and chase them down. The word here is stronger than follow. It's a contrast to enemies. Goodness and love will run after you and chase you down and overtake you and arrest you. <laughs> it will run you down wherever you are in the deepest, darkest valley of death. Goodness and faithfulness to covenant, which is unconditional love, will chase you down and overtake you and arrest you and be your companion and bring you into the house of the Lord forever. And the house of the Lord, we think of the house of the Lord as some mansions in the sweet by and by on the other side up there in heaven beyond Pluto <laughs> and Neptune. <clears throat> that's, why, that's why they've been sending up all these probes into space to try and find it. <clears throat> but the Hebrew mind is nowhere near like that. The Hebrew mind is that the house of the Lord was the tabernacle. David burned with zeal to, build a, to, to turn it into a temple a dwelling place for God. God dwelt among his people. And the tabernacle was just an image of the Garden of Eden because all the canopies had symbols of angels and it was the cosmic temple. God dwells in his creation and his creation is holy and beautiful as his cosmic temple, which became embodied in the tabernacle where God... <clears throat> lived among his people in his house called the tabernacle, which then became the, the temple which only Solomon could build because there was too much blood on David's hands, although he burned with zeal to build that temple for God. But God said, you can't do it. And David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which is basically, I will dwell in new creation. <clears throat> 
We are not destined to live in heaven. We were made human beings on earth for the earth to live forever on the earth, but on a new earth where heaven and earth becomes one through Jesus, the good shepherd. And so we are to rule over the earth. Are you, you're aware of that. Over the new earth. And we're going to live with God in creation in his garden cathedral, which will be better than the Garden of Eden. Eden in the Hebrew means the light. God's garden of the light. That's why they called it paradise, which was basically kiboshed and messed up through Adam and Eve's sin, which the good shepherd, Jesus, restores and changes and begins to recreate all over again, in which you and I live and begin to rule and reign as the first Adam, um, Adam and Eve under the chief shepherd of the sheep. May God bless you. Can I pray for you? Would you like to stand? <clears throat> So, Yeshua Hanotsri, Jesus the Nazarene, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, we worship you as the chief shepherd of your sheep. And we receive once again, Lord, all that you give to us as our shepherd. I bless this church, Harvest Church, and all who are listening to me online, I bless them, I bless you with what you need from the shepherd right now. It's food, it's drink, it's healing, it's provision. Don't be scared if you're struggling financially. Don't be scared if you've lost your job. Don't be scared. God will give you your next meal. God will be faithful. God will provide. Trust God. Don't give in to fear in the name of Jesus. I rebuke fear in the name of Jesus, and I speak faith into your heart because you can trust God's character. He's a God of integrity. He is good. Tov and chesed. God's goodness and God's love is chasing you down and catching up with you. I bless you with healing for your body. I bless you with peace in your mind. And I bless your finances. I bless your home. I bless your marriages. I bless your children. And I bless your businesses in the name of Jesus Christ. God is good. In Jesus' name.